Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of BRI's Primary Source Close Read, where we walk you through important sources in U.S. history. I'm Mary Patterson, and I work on the content team here at BRI, and I'm really excited to be joined by my colleague all the way across the country, Liz Evans. Hey, Liz. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm doing really well. So Liz is a fairly new face to the BRI team officially. So Liz, tell us a little bit about your role here at BRI. So I am very lucky. I am the regional programs manager. So I get to develop and um, implement programming for teachers around the country. Um, and we're really excited this year because we get to do votes for women um, as well as presidents and the constitution. So it's gonna be a fun, a fun year. Yeah, and um, it is, like Liz said, it's a big year for us ladies because this August we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. So there's some serious girl power going on, and in that vein, Liz and I are going to be looking at sources related to the passage of the 19th Amendment. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. we are going to be looking at a couple of things, but we're really gonna be focusing on a political cartoon called The Sky Is Now Her Limit. And the artist is Elmer Andrews Bushnell. And this was published in 1920 as a response to the passage of the 19th Amendment. So the 19th Amendment, very short, right? We have it up here on the screen, like we said, is ratified in 1920. So we're coming up on the 100th anniversary was it's a huge achievement, right? This is, it's a very, when you look at it on the screen, it's, it's pretty short and concise, but it was, this was quite a victory and there was so much work and struggle and sweat and tears that went into getting this amendment passed. And I think, I mean, the story of Votes for Women is something that we explore in our Votes for Women curriculum and in our homework help videos, which you guys should definitely check out if you're not familiar with them. But um, it's hard to, I think, as a, you know, we sort of take it for granted, right? It's 2020 and I can vote and I've always been able to vote, but there was so much hard work that went into getting this, you know, even passed in the first place. And I think, you know, because we're BRI, we like the backstory. So I think it's worth talking a little bit about sort of bring you up to the Spark Notes version of how this amendment actually got passed. So like the fight for women's suffrage is nothing new. It's not like this happened overnight, but by the early 20th century, the women's suffrage movement had kind of stalled out. There was the split in the movement over um, working towards a federal amendment or going a state by state approach. So there was a lot of sort of rebuilding and regrouping going on. And along comes this woman who I just love learning about her. I'm like, the more I read about her, the more I, I really admire her, Alice Paul. And Alice Paul, um, her leadership, I think you could say was a real turning point in, get, in galvanizing the movement and getting this amendment actually passed. So Alice Paul is, I think her style was um, alienated some people and she was, she was kind of confrontational. She was influenced by the suffrage movement in Great Britain, which was a lot more militant, they used you know, picketing and hunger strikes and things that weren't really done in the United States. And she becomes a part of that movement and sort of takes that back to the United States with her. And she even splits from you know, the suffrage movement in um, 1916 and forms the National Women's Party. And I, I found this quote from her, it's actually from three years before she splits off and finds her own, founds her own party but it's, it is, says, quote, it is better as far as getting the vote is concerned, I believe, to have a small united group than an immense debating society. And uh, that's Alice Paul in 1914. I love that quote as someone who is really drawn to actions over words. I can just, you can sort of feel her frustration there. Like we need to get this, this party going. So um, I think that's, so she plays an, a, a tremendous role in, in getting this amendment passed. Well, and even like the more research I did on her, like understanding that a lot of the tactics she used for the time were very 
you know, when we say militant, I mean, maybe in today's standards, they wouldn't be so jaw dropping. But back then, a lot of the things that she did, you know, with her hunger strike, I'm with you, Mary, the more I learned about her, the more I just became so interested in the story as a whole, because I know for me as a student, you know, I learned about Lucretia Mott and Cherry, or Carrie Chapman Cat. Her name is a little, a little yeah. um, And Alice Paul wasn't ever really discussed, and it's not really until recently, and I'm diving into curriculum and diving into her, that just having an understanding that, you know, change, especially when we talk about voting rights, is very messy and complicated, and there's so many different ways to do it. So it was interesting, I know, for me to see all of these different sides of these women um, who marched forth to get this passed. Right. And I think, like you said, there, there is, this was a movement. So it's, I don't want to just say it was like without Alice Paul was the only person that mattered. There were so many women and men who threw their support over this over time and they had different styles and they didn't always agree. I think anyone that's worked in a group understands that, right? There's all, there's different styles and it's, you know, it's messy. Maybe it's one step forward, two steps back. But, um, but yeah, Alice Paul, I think, so many things about her life were exceptional. Like you said, she gets her PhD. She attends suffragist, suffragist meetings as a young girl because her mother is a suffragist. So she's, um, I mean, she takes a leading, a, t- a leading role and she uses the, that hunger strike and um, there are, she pickets, she actually pickets President Wilson, the way picket the White House every day during World War I. And we talked about this idea of being more militant and confrontational. The idea that you would picket a president during wartime, people were just like, what is, a lot of people were just shocked by that. And they were heckled and mobs would try to attack them. And they they weren't, they were peacefully, you know, just standing there with a sign. Um, kind of, if you were President Wilson, you probably weren't too thrilled about this because they were calling him out. You know, we were fighting this war, World War I, to make the world safe for democracy, but we don't have democracy at home because women can't vote, we have no voice. Um, so I'm sure he wasn't too thrilled about that, but they're arrested for that on sort of these trumped up charges of blocking traffic. And they're, they're sent to prison, Alice Paul and her followers, and they're treated really terribly. And they're force fed because they're refusing to eat, again, a tactic learned from the British. And just force feeding is, it's hard to comprehend <laughs> how awful that is. I'm just, I'm like, I'm like cringing just thinking about it, so. <laughs> You know, I'm, you're, when you think about this, though, like even like picketing in front of the White House and I mean, the force feedings like that garners a lot of attention and whether it's positive or negative attention, you know, even people being upset with her for picketing during, you know, the Great War and there's other things we have to think about, but it, it brings forth attention to a cause and I'm with you, the force feeding and hearing how they did it and how she endured that you know, time after time and day after day, but it is like people see this and it brings attention because it's it's not like back in the day, you know, you could just throw out a quick tweet and say like, hey, everybody, we're working for this. It's it's a very different way to get that message out. Um, Even here in Arizona, like we never really think about women's rights because we became a state in 1912 and women had the right to vote like it was never but it's we're it's the region that we're in because if you look at just regionally the west gave women the right to vote first in their states so i think that's i mean that's an interesting i mean in the the movement itself had this debate do we pursue a federal amendment or do we do the state-by-state approach in the western states were quicker to give women the right to vote than here like i'm i'm here in northern virginia good old Eastern seaboard. But um, but yeah, different approaches, different ideas on Carrie Chapman Cat, you mentioned, she just, she was about supporting Wilson and supporting the war. So she was not really a part of these, you know, pretty confrontational in your face tactics that Alice Paul and the National Women's Party are using. But um, together, right, their work together, I think, spurs, you know, Wilson and Congress to finally you know, pass this and and it's ratified and it becomes, right, it's written into our constitution. And um, 
like a lot of our in amendments, you know, they're, they're pretty small, but they have, if you think about the story behind it, it's really, I think it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, it's 1920. We've just, you know, women have the right to vote. And then here is the political cartoon that we mentioned in the beginning of our recording here. The sky is now her limit. And the cartoonist um, was a, he was sort of a lifelong political cartoonist. He worked for, he drew for um, papers in New York and also in Ohio. And I believe this cartoon first appeared in an Ohio newspaper in 1920 as a response to the passage of the 19th Amendment. And he was known for um, using sort of cartoons to make social commentary, which I think is a pretty, I think cartoons are still doing that in the present day. And um, so this image I think is, is really, there's a lot to unpack here for sure. And I love political cartoons because I think that, you know, everybody comes in with a different lens and you all see different things. And, you know, we can, when we look at text, like we're all reading the same text and even that was a little bit different perspectives. But I think that, you know, it's such an old cliche thing, but a picture says a thousand words. And this one, I mean, truly does. When you look at all the details that are put in here and all the rungs of the ladder, um, and even the fact that she has on a milkmaid's yoke. So she, it's not like she's putting that down to climb the ladder. She's oh, carrying yeah. that <laughs> up with her. Right. Makes it even more difficult. That's, see, that's, that's one of the things I love about using images as a primary source is that when you look at them, and especially when you're looking at them with students and you have all these different sets of eyes on them at the same time, someone always says something, even if I've looked at it so many times before, that I never thought about. And your comment about she's, she's not putting down this yoke. Or maybe she will, but I don't know. That's a question for us, the viewer. But she, is she, does she have to go up the ladder with that? I don't even go up like past the third step on the ladder. <laughs> like I was just holding a ladder for my husband the other day and I was like, I'm glad you're taking care of this. But anyway, I digress. So, um, but yeah, but I think, I mean, just looking at it before you even try to make out the text and I'll bring up what's on the wrong of the ladder in a second, because I know some of them are a little difficult to read. You know, there's this woman, she's carrying what I would imagine to be heavy buckets and she's looking like there's this light shining down on, on this ladder and the sky is her limit. So can she can achieve everything, anything, right? I mean, is that how people were reacting to this? I mean, this is a huge victory that to finally, you know, all this work to get this, um, you know, to get the right to vote and what next, big question mark. Well, and it's an interesting thing too. Um, if you look at the shading of where the dark is and where it kind of stops before it changes to light, like the equal suffrage rung is in like the light, but even like going down, like a lot of those jobs, it's a curious question of why are these in the dark part of it? You know, why are these in that shading yeah. there? And, and again, like there's, there's can be lots of different things, but that's another thing I noticed, you know, she's looking up toward the light right now. She's carrying these things. And again, I noticed it because I was like, I wonder what that is because I've never seen that before. And, and she's holding it and it's, it would be a completely different look if those were next to her, but they're still on her. Mm -hmm. And so how that looks, because, you know, equal suffrage, that rung is so big and it's in kind of the transition of the dark and the light in that background. Yeah, and I do, I mean, I have to, I do, I like that teacher is two rungs above house drudgery. <laughs> well, and I looked at that um, being a former teacher too. But I looked at that and kind of looked at those like bottom rungs and noticed that those were typical careers for women in the early 1900s. So that was like a, you know, like a nurse and a teacher. And I love it says arts, crafts, and science all together. Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know that people would necessarily agree with that today. But it but is interesting. Was, Sorry, go ahead. But those like having all of those like women's jobs at the bottom and they're all below equal suffrage is again, another interesting question. Mm -hmm. So 
why are they below it? Right, and it's also, I mean, this, the, the cartoonist is a man. So if a woman, if Alice Paul drew a cartoon to celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment, would this, I wonder what that would look like, or if Carrie Chapman Catt had a cartoon, would there be different wrongs? Would they not use this image of a ladder? Would it be, I don't know. So I just think that um, it definitely implies sort of, I like the idea of, you know, one step at a time, but how we are ranking the different steps and things that are available to women is, is interesting. Um, it is, and it brings up the, how hard it is sometimes to look at a cartoon in 2020 that was made in 1920 because clearly like I, and I agree with you like as I'm looking at these it's like I don't know that I would necessarily put them in that order but that is a present day person judging a cartoon from a hundred years ago and even that's an interesting question to ask like how I mean clearly some of these things have changed and maybe some of them don't even exist anymore but what is you know what does that even look like the, um, I'll bring up, so I, this is kind of in the reverse order, but it's, I know it's a little hard to read. So if you're following along with us, here is how the, the artist has labeled the different rungs of the ladder with slavery being the lowest rung and the presidency being the highest rung. But I think, I mean, this idea of, of presentism and thinking about it with our, our 2020 lens, it's definitely something that students are going to do. And it's worth, I mean, these are sort of, I mean, they're big questions and they're timeless questions. And I think that that's part of the fun to me about using the primary sources. There's a lot you can talk about and unpack. And you're just, I mean, it's, it's in essence, it's kind of a simple picture. A woman, the base of the ladder, the lap rungs are, <laughs> are labeled and then there's a light at the top. So the, 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 it's simple in a way, but it's not simple the more you dive into it. Well, and the best part about primary sources like this is there's not necessarily a right answer. Like, I mean, I mean, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, Mary, where you see things, you know, hundreds of times throughout, you know, teaching or researching or whatever. And every time there's something a little bit different that you notice, or you're having a discussion with somebody and you're like, oh my gosh, I never even thought about that. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, we all come with different lenses. And I think that is something that's so valuable about, you know, primary resources like this is it can create a conversation that is so rich because it's not just a answer. Yeah. And I like even just looking at this now, wage equality is two steps above equal suffrage. And that's something you hear about a lot in the present day. Like, is that again, where would that go on the ladder? Where did the artist think it was supposed to go? Where might a woman have thought it would go, thought, think it would go? Where do we in 2020 think that goes? So there's a lot of, a lot of tax that you can take when looking at this. Well, and one of the things I found interesting, you know, as we're looking at kind of the higher rungs up there, one of them was Congress, but at this point, Jeanette Rankin had already been a representative in Congress so before this even passed, but then she wasn't reelected. So again, knowing that one of these had already happened, how it's still so high. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the presidency, which again is a very interesting look because as we look at the election of 2020, how many women ran in the primaries? And how is, you know, how has that kind of progressed over the hundred years? I think that there's, I mean, I think it's, it's ultimately this ladder in a way is sort of, I think it's the value structure of the person who made it and to what extent did it reflect the views of other men and the other progressive men. I say progressive because he, in the sense that he used the cartoons to, in his history, Mm -hmm. as a cartoonist prior to this image. He used his, his cartoons to attack political corruption and sort of, sort of like this idea of muckraking. Mm -hmm. This image is really interesting because it, it clearly reflects some assumptions and values about the artist and more broadly the time in which it comes, in which it comes from. But it's, it's also interesting to think about 
again, if we put on our 2020 lens, what's missing? Like, what would we consider to be a step forward after equal suffrage? I wouldn't, like, perhaps I would not put notary public next. I'm still not exactly sure what a notary public is. Um, I know I worked with one once upon a time. But um, yeah, what's missing? And that might be an interesting question to ask students if you're using this image with them as well. It would be interesting to ask them how uh, how even does the artist the values of that time and then the things that they notice are missing like how does that even reflect 1920s values because there are things missing on here that maybe they never thought would be something attainable for a woman and i'm trying to actually look at the um ladder now like is there an ending of the ladder like yes the highest rung is presidency but if you think about a ladder like it goes up so far but there's still space if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah and i think yeah that's an interesting point like even if you even if you are at the top rung of the ladder you're still reaching up to something yeah. um, and i it's it's not clear right i mean did it just was this just the cutoff of the space that he had in the newspaper or was he trying to say once women achieve the presidency everything's better i don't i don't know i don't think um and then just, or are there other positions of, of leadership besides the presidency that women should aspire to, like like a woman CEO, like you were saying, it's something that probably wasn't even in the, on the mind of someone in the 1920s for a woman to be in that position. And women were kind of CEOs, so to speak, of some of, you know, companies, I think of like Madam C.J. Walker comes to mind, but just this idea of, yeah, the sky is her limit. I think just the title, it's not, it's not the presidency, I don't think is the end all. I would argue just based on the title itself. But I think that's an interesting question for any of you or your student to think about as well. And I think that, so on that same vein of, you know, progress is, um, it's something that there isn't really a stopping point. Like we have in 1920, the amendment has been passed, but that doesn't mean this movement and the work is over. And that's one of the things Again, going back to Alice Paul, you have to admire this, this woman. She almost immediately starts working for another amendment, which she names the Lucretia Mott Amendment for fellow abolition, well, fellow suffragists and also a noted abolition, abolitionist to, for equal, basically equal rights. And it's submitted to Congress every, like every year from 1923 to 1942. So she is, Alice Paul is working, like she knows that um, the movement is, it's not done, the work continues. And I think that's what's really admirable about her is that this was a huge victory and it was an achievement and it was a celebration, but also, okay, now what? What's the next thing that we need to go for? And then the, the amendment is reworded slightly and then it takes on her name, the Alice Paul Amendment. And it's, it, this, if this looks a little familiar to you, this is because this is the basis for the Equal Rights Amendment, which is something that sort of has a spotlight on again. We're talking about 2020. It's come back up in the news. Well, it's an interest, interesting thing, too, to look at and to, you know, have you know, students or viewers look at the differences between these two amendments and why you know, words matter, especially when you're talking about the law, and especially when you're talking about an amendment to the Constitution. Mm. You know, like you said, most amendments are very short. Um, our Constitution isn't that long. And so if you have a document like that, those words matter. And, you know, why, why changes were made between these two amendments and why that matters, I think is a really interesting thing, because in the Lucretia Ma Amendment, I don't actually see the word law, like equality under the law. And when I look at, you know, Alice Paul's, I think of things like the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. and, you know, those kinds of things. So even the difference in wording is such an interesting thing to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great point that um, each word is very intentional. Like this is the Constitution. It's this this document that we has been has guided this American experiment since nearly the beginning. I'm saying nearly because of the Articles of Confederation. So 
to put something in there is a big deal and to, the language is very purposeful and very intentional. And then I'll bring up the Equal Rights Amendment here. So there's, a, it ex, ex, excuse me, it's expanded a little bit. And then um, again, it was passed by Congress in 1972, but it was not ratified by the states to the deadline. So, um, and then again, to Virginia, where I'm coming from Virginia today, they, they recently, the Virginia Assembly just ratified it. So there's this big question mark, like what does this mean? And um, what's next? Right. The, the, the saga continues. And I think that's also really, a really powerful thing to bring into the classroom because it's not, it ends with a question, like a really good Socratic seminar. We don't know the answer. The answer is like unfolding. And I think that's, um, we're still, you know, the struggle continues or does it continue? Is that something to talk about? And, you know, everybody can weigh in with what they think. Well, and the best part about that is, again, there's not an answer. And a lot of times when you ask those questions, it leads to more research. Like, well, if Virginia, you know, ratified it and they're the 38th state, why isn't it in the Constitution? And that's a good thing for students to go back and look at, you know, looking at deadlines of ratification and, and what that means and what Congress's role is in all of this. You know, one of the things that we've talked about is, African-American women didn't really get the solid right to vote until the Voting Rights Amendment was passed in 1965. So even, you know, none of these are perfect. And when we talk about, you know, our constitution and we talk about amendments, it's a more perfect union. It was never meant to be that, but it's, it's an interesting look at, you know, the 19th Amendment through um, the proposal of the Equal Rights Amendment to today. And what that timeline looks like and in another hundred years how are people going to look back and say like we're in the 200th year now of women's you know 19th amendment what has happened since yeah I think well I hope I'm not around for that personally <laughs> I don't want to be around that long but I do I mean it's I think that's a really great and it's a poetic way to think about it too it's a more perfect union we're not perfect right humans if we were angels we wouldn't need government um so it's just it's this constant you know this striving and working continues and different people will bring different voices different styles so there's a lot i think there's a lot to um there's a lot to mull over just in just in looking at these amendments and in that particular image so i think that um, hopefully that you learned something from this. Hopefully you have some ideas that you can bring into the classroom. Everything that we looked at today is in the Bill of Rights Institute's new online U.S. history resource, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. It's all online. It's free. It's got a treasure trove of primary sources and essays that you can use with your students. So definitely check it out, sign up, explore, and Thank you so much for being with us today. Girl power. <laughs> Thank you, ladies.